Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2015 Royal Terrell Museum Speaker Series. Uh, today, the Royal Terrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Dr. Jean-Bernard Terrell. Uh, he is the curator of invertebrate paleontology at the Royal Ontario Museum. He's also uh, associate professor in the departments of ecology and evolutionary biology and earth science at the University of Toronto. Uh, after becoming fascinated with fossils as a child in France, uh, he spent the summers of his teenage years volunteering at archaeological and paleo paleontological digs across Europe. Uh, Jean Bernard then obtained his undergraduate degree in paleontology, sedimentology, and chronology from the University Claude Bernard in Lyon, France. At part of his degree, uh, Jean Bernard studied the problematic Burgess shale animal Banthia constricta. He then moved to Canada and completed his doctoral dissertation at the University of Toronto. For his PhD, Jean Bernard studied the taphonomy and community paleoecology of the Burgess shale. Dr. Caron's research focuses on fossilization and ecology of animals that lived during the Cambrian explosion of diversity around 540 to 480 million years ago. Dr. Caron leads regular fieldwork activities during the summer to recover fossils of these animals from the Burgess Shale in the Rocky Mountains of, of British Columbia. Several of his studies, including announcements of new discoveries of new organisms, have been published in top scientific journals such as Nature and Science. In 2010, Dr. Caron received the Pacaya Award for outstanding contributions to Canadian research from the Paleontology Division of the Royal of, of the uh, Geological Association of Canada. Today, Dr. Caron will present new a newly discovered Burgess Shale locality in Kootenay National Park, and some of the important fossils that have been found there. Specifically, uh, one of the earliest earliest fishes, Metaspergina. So, without further uh, delay, here is Dr. Jean Bernard Caron. Thank you, Caleb. You all hear me fine? Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, would like to, uh, to thank everyone here, and especially Francois Tagnac for inviting me to, to give this talk today. Change the title a little bit. Um, <coughs> the story I'm going to tell today is related to the chordate and vertebrate story. All right, so I will be talking about fossils that are close to half a billion years old. Uh, and those fossils, are from, uh, are evolved during an event called the Cambrian Explosion. Uh, this is uh, the emergence of animals in the fossil record starting around 542 million years ago. The Burr shell itself is about 508 million years and uh, records in its full bloom, if you want, this particular event. Now, I want to focus this talk on the evolution of uh, chordates and vertebrates, and we start with the uh, this slide that uh, basically shows you um, the, the diversity of uh, disparity of fish that existed during the Paleozoic and and fish time. Um, I'm going to talk about the origins, something we don't really know much. All right. So the best fossil vertebrates that we know uh, so far, we know so far, are from China, are from the Shenzhen Valley. I'm sure you all read the title here. Um, and uh, the best, well, we know basically a few, uh, a few uh, species. Um, this one here is not from a single, originally described from a single specimen. Uh, it's called uh, Milotroningia. And uh, as you can already see, uh, well, it's actually hard to see what's really happening here, except we probably have the mouth around here, and here you have probably muscle bands. Uh, it's not really uh, a very good fossil or very clear fossil. There's a second specimen of the species that we found a bit later on. Uh, but again, uh, it's kind of difficult to see the features that are particularly important for us, uh, which are actually related to features of the head. And conveniently, in this reconstruction, they kind of turn the head away, so we can see it. Um, a better known fish from the Chandrang Baota, which I fail to say that it's slightly older than the bird shell by about 10 million years. Um, this is Ekuetu. This is a much better known fossil fish, a uh, very primitive fossil fish. It's about 500, as I said, 515 million years old. And uh, we know about 500 specimens of them. Uh, and some of them really shows very nicely it's part of the head, preserved here with pairs of very large eyes. So here we are talking about um, a vertebrate, an animal that 
you can classify as a primitive fish. So let me bring you now to things that are closer to your background here. And I'm so jealous that uh, you guys are living here and so far away in Toronto and not being able to, to spend more time in, uh, in Rockies than I, than I would like to. But this is really an amazing place. And it's an amazing place for the story of our origins. So this is a reconstruction of the Bersha community of the Walker Quarry. Uh, um, this, is a, 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 this is a reconstruction of the of the community or part of the community that lived during that time at the Walker Quarry, uh, the main bush outside. So you see there are a lot of uh, common or familiar uh, animals in there, lots of uh, sponges in particular, and uh, other in familiar forms like this guy, uh, a primitive uh, body armored uh, mollusk. Now the first fossil I'm going to talk about is Picaya, uh, grasslands. And Picaya was actually described by Charles Walcott, the discoverer of the bird shell. It was described in 1911 in the monographic series uh, from the Smithsonian Institutions. And um, Walcott figured two specimens that you can see here. And at the time, he thought uh, that these uh, fossils were actually annelids, a group uh, that include today the earthworms. Uh, those are the, the specimens illustrated. And uh, one thing I should mention about Walcott's monographs is the fact that he, he retouched the, the figures using a pencil um, because fossils are actually extremely hard to see and, and to photograph. That was the way to try to highlight some features, and including some features that are actually not there. Um, I'm going to demonstrate that in a second. So this is the original specimen, and uh, as illustrated by Walcott, this is a picture that you can take today with normal light conditions. And this is a picture that you can take with polarized, cross-polarized lights. So you cross-polarize the, 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 well, the light source and the camera lens. And you can see more details, of course, of the fossil using this method. Um, this is just a close-up showing the, the retouched area by Walcott, in particular those areas here that really you know, are, are somewhat there but not quite the same. Um, so, I mean, obviously, retouching images is problematic. Uh, you will not be able to publish anything today, but at the time, it was uh, thought to be, to be fine. Um, not only that, but uh, perhaps Walcott has some difficulties in polarizing his fossils. Uh, this is actually a view. Uh, the ventral surface is here, and the dorsal surface is here. Uh, not only that, but the fossil is incomplete. Uh, it's missing the front. It's missing the back. In fact, there's much more than that. Um, and the fossil is reversed. So this is actually the head, and that's the dorsal surface of the fossil. Uh, but of course, using polarizing light it, it makes things easier. Now, Wycott uh, found additional specimens after 1911 that he never described, uh, more than 50 specimens. But everything that we knew about Picaya uh, until about the late 70s, or at least published, was published in 1911 and 1931. Um, and it's basically the same thing, same description. So almost really nothing about this uh, very uh, interesting uh, fossil until my colleague Simon Connor Morris made a, a very quick comment in his uh, general paper about the bird shell fauna that Picaya might actually be some sort of chordate. And that really spared it a huge amount of interest. Uh, and you probably noticed that uh, the work was in preparation in 1979. Um, well, that was uh, a fossil that was used by Steve Jay Gould in Wonderful Life to uh, highlight the importance of the bird shell, in particular the role of contingency in evolution. The fact that, well, actually Pika made it, so we are thankful and uh, to be here today, thanks uh, to, to, ch to chance uh, in some ways. Um, but so Pika was certainly thought to be uh, uh, a bona fide uh, chordate, if I, if I may say. Um, and became very popular, uh, especially after Gould's book, um, all sorts of things. Uh, a chair called Picaya. Uh, I actually gave a talk recently in Italy. And uh, the de designer of this chair st stood at the end of, the, of my talk uh, and said, well, I actually designed this. So um, I'm still uh, waiting to receive one of these chairs so I can try. Um, <coughs> so my colleague Simon uh, 
and Conor Morris and myself, we decided to pull our resources together uh, to look at all the specimens from the Smithsonian and all the specimens uh, from the ROM. Uh, and uh, we had more than 114 specimens in total, uh, so a very large collection. Uh, so we, we published this monograph uh, in 2012 uh, about Pitaya. And um, as I mentioned, collections are from the two institutions here. Uh, and most of the specimens, actually all the specimens, come from this area that some of you may be uh, familiar with. This is, the, this is the, uh, a trail, the Park Signal Trail. Uh, and and uh, Montfield is on, on this side, and then Montwata on this side, and you have Trans Canyon Highway on this, uh, in the next valley there. So you can actually visit the site. Um, and this is the Pax Canada Trail that you can take during the summer, leading to the Walker Quarry. Uh, so the specimens come from, most of them come from the Walker Quarry, but not all of them. There's a couple of occurrences uh, in the quarries above, above it. So let's go back to, to Walcott. Uh, in, uh, uh, this is in 1910. You can see the stage of this quarry after this uh, one year of, of field collections. Um, at the end of, uh, of uh, well, uh, during his last visit, uh, Walcott uh, thought that the quarry probably had nothing else to reveal. Um, and, um, uh, but he thought many of them are still good for exchange. So what happened is the Royal Museum uh, starting in the mid-1990s, uh, started to excavate the floor of the Walker Quarry for the first time and started to discover a lot of fossils there in the very sand beds that uh, Walker thought to be a fossiliferous without fossils. And most of the PKI specimens collected were from those lower levels. So um, while studying the specimens, we use different techniques that are available to scientists today. Uh, uh, including uh, elemental mapping. This is an elemental map uh, here in red of the carbon element. Um, this, this is a fossil coated with aluminum uh, chloride to highlight some of the very fun three-dimensional uh, features of the fossil. Um, mind that all the fossils are preserved flat, uh, but there's still a bit of three-dimensionality in some areas. Um, this is a, a backscatter electron microscope uh, a microscope uh, imagery of, of the fossil itself. Um, and this is cross-polarized light. So I mean, using different methods, uh, you can actually start to uh, tease out some details that you will not be able using normal photographic techniques. So, and they are very complementary to each other. We also realize there's a range of preservation in these collections uh, from you know, relatively uh, perfect, well, relatively well-preserved specimens like this one to increasingly uh, decayed specimen. Uh, this is really a, a difficult to see specimen, uh, but we are confident this is a, a specimen of Pitaya in a, in a rotted uh, stage, a highly advanced rotted stage. Uh, you can see uh, decay, evidence of decay in some, some parts. So why is it important here? Well, it's important to see how uh, features can preserve in various stages of decay or not. There's also different uh, range of preservation, uh, uh, of attitudes of preservation uh, of the fossils within uh, the, the, uh, the mud or the, the layers. Uh, some of them are very curved, like this one. Some of them are kind of twisting in all directions. Um, the fossils will have been entombed very quickly by mud ploy events. And the animals, uh, most of them, we think, uh, were buried alive. And uh, this sort of... Um, uh, contortions of the body, we think suggest that the animals might have tried to escape. Um, it's a speculation, but uh, a large number of specimens show a quite, uh, uh, quite uh, extraordinary types of uh, twisting here. There's a, a range of sizes. Uh, this is to scale. Uh, the scale bar here is five millimeter. So this specimen is almost 10 centimeter long compared to the smaller specimen that we have. And, uh, and uh, which is probably around a centimeter long or less. And you can see that the, 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 the actually perhaps not uh, uh, from, your, from your seats, but the features are very similar. So we think during ontogeny, uh, there's probably not much difference between the juveniles and, and the adult form. Now let's go back into the small details. The details are always important in science, uh, but these are the details of the head parts using different methods, uh, again, of photographic methods. 
Um, what we have at the front is a pair of conicals, which is this one here showing up. Um, so the head will have been around here. There's no evidence of eyes. And uh, what's interesting is after the head, which is, you can see the size quite small, uh, there's a, a series of uh, smaller um, appendages, if you want, that are on either side of the body. Uh, and at the base, there's some pores that you may not see from, from where you are seated, but they are small, tiny pores. So we think that the, well, the mouth was probably located around here. And this represents a pharyngeal area where you know, the water will enter this direction and will exit through the pores. Um, and presumably, uh, that was a way for the animal to filter feed uh, in its environment. So this is a complete specimen. Uh, the head is around here. That's the tail. Uh, this is using reflective light, so direct light uh, conditions. Um, there's a couple of features that we emphasize here, um, which are quite, quite important. I forgot to put the caption here, but in blue, uh, this is what we think is uh, the nerve cord. And uh, in yellow, this is what uh, we think is the, the notochord here preserved. Um, so this is really an important uh, observation, important observations that we made here using mostly the carbon map. You can see, it very, uh, you can see faint uh, lines here, uh, which are not so clear, obviously, using normal lighting conditions. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is the, the position of the anus is probably around here, or it's close to here, it's close to terminal. So the other uh, important feature of this animal is the number of um, muscle bands that run along the body from the anterior to the posterior axis. And you can see this band, they have a very fine sigmoidal um, sort of curved, it's, uh, it's very fine. Not quite like your salmon steak, uh, which shows very clear W-shaped uh, muscle band. So um, we think actually that um, this type of muscle may indicate um, uh, that uh, it might have been good at locomotion, but perhaps uh, this represents uh, slow types of muscles. This represents fast type of muscles. They have very sharp uh, angles here in the, in the banding. So now, what does that fit? What does that, what does that mean for, early, uh, uh, for the early evolution of, of, the, of, the, of the cortex? So this is a phylogenetic tree. There's a lot of colors here. That probably you know most of them. The star represents the position of where we think the guy might be. Uh, this is the, the cordates, uh, a large clade that includes cephalocordates, neurocordates, and then uh, the vertebrates. Uh, so as you can see, we think it's quite basal uh, in that tree, and we think it's near the, uh, the beginning of the cordate tree. Um, it's not a fish. It's not yet a fish. Uh, it's an animal that evolved muscle uh, bands, not for nerve cord. Um, but the head is very simple, no evidence of eyes. So it's a very primitive form. We think it's quite different from a cephalocordate uh, uh, or lancelets that you may have heard about. Um, lancelets don't have this pair of chronicles at the front, don't have this uh, pair of um, appendages along the side of the head, uh, and many other features are quite different. So here we are talking about, with Picaya, we're talking about really uh, the roots of where we come from uh, in many ways. So there I have a video perhaps of Picaya gracilans and uh, showing how we think this animal might have been um, swimming around. This animation is based on, on detail, anatomical details, and, um, and uh, that's how best we think the, the morphology will have looked like for this animal. Now, uh, in terms of uh, um, the, the actual swimming ability of this animal, we don't know how fast this animal could swim. Um, but we think that this animal was probably living at the bottom of the ocean at the time. We find a lot of specimens, as, a, as you saw, buried at different angles, so buried very quickly. And they were not living an, in the water column. They were most likely living in the bottom of the ocean, probably uh, maybe deposit feeders or filter feeders. All right, and this is the transition uh, to, the, to my next beast that I want to talk about today called Metasprigina. Um, well, actually, this animal, I'm going to tell you, has something to do, or to tell us at least, about the origin of, of the jaws. Um, here is a, 
famous textbook example of how we think jaws might have evolved, this is a hypothetical um, scenario that in the ancestral fish or uh, vertebrates, um, there's a number of pharyngeal bars that are present, and of which the first two or three will eventually evolve into the jaws. So in the fossil record, we have very good evidence for these transitions here. I think there's no question about the fact that you, know, the, the, you can see in many fossils these transitions, mostly in uh, cilia and Devonian types of fish. Uh, but this idea, which actually um, um, of, of um, seriality, this is an idea that is actually from the 19th century and developed by uh, Gegen Bohr, who was uh, a morphologist and embryologist, um, well, it was very subjective, but still in textbooks today. This is 2014, uh, 15, actually, uh, Benton uh, Vertebrate Paleontology. However, there, is, there was absolutely no evidence in the fossil record for this to have ever happened um, until, until we published our paper last year. Uh, and uh, this is the animal that, uh, that was known uh, from the Berisha as Metasprigina until some more recent discoveries. And this is, uh, so this is a, uh, a couple of plates. These are a couple of plates of two specimens. Maybe confusing here, but let me show you. Uh, these are the two specimens that were known from the Walker quarry. Uh, you can see the size, it's quite big, you know, probably around 10 centimeter long. Um, but you probably agree with me that with those two things, uh, there's very little we could say. The only thing we could say is different from Picaya. Uh, he has very sharp biomers, and uh, therefore it, it's probably something more evolved than Picaya in terms of the musculature. Uh, but the cranial region was very poorly known, uh, so it really remained in, in, in the obscurity, uh, uh, I guess, uh, even in 2008. We, no one really heard probably of Metasprigina. Well, it turns out that the Ronto Museum collections uh, uh, from the work Walk or Korea, look over the few Metasprigina specimens. I'm going to show you the worst, and I'm going to get to the best. So let me show you the worst first. Those are the worst from the Walk or Quarry. Uh, those are the original specimen rephotographed. Uh, those are the Smithsonian uh, collection. This is the first specimen, and this is the second specimen. And I, I took different pictures showing different details. Well, actually, with new uh, no, um, photograph te techniques, we can still uh, find uh, I think describe these features better, but still, with those two uh, specimens, couldn't do much. Those are the new finds from uh, the Walker Quarry made by the Ronto Museum. Well, it's kind of depressing. Um, only bits and pieces, mostly muscle bands, which probably belong to the same type of, of organism, but very uh, difficult to see, except this one here which is the best of the Walker Quarry specimen, I think. Um, it shows an int, uh, some hints of pharyngeal bars. Uh, it shows uh, an eye here, you have to trust me. Uh, and then uh, muscle bands, and then posterior part is missing. Um, now, what's interesting about this, you see the muscle bands here, the front are darker, and there's an int here that those are actually called arcualias. Those are the primitive types of vertebrae uh, that we find also in the Changjiang. So this is actually an important specimen showing that. Now there have been discoveries of a number of problematic fossils. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, some examples that we think are related to the same group of fish. Doesn't mean that it's the same species, of course, but we think they are probably some type of metasprina. One is a discovery made by my colleagues, uh, uh, Kimberly Johnson and, and John, and uh, and the Johnson and, and uh, when Paul and uh, I read the unfortunate uh, news uh, that uh, Kimberly just passed away a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, she was the lead author of this paper. And she, um, with her husband uh, and when, uh, photographed this specimen here, which is actually here at the Royal Tier Museum. Um, this is this is a section of the slab that was available, and so I, I learned that specimen. Uh, from the material and doing, uh, and by basically using polarizing filter, realize that this slab is actually entirely covered of this 
uh, creature. You can see some some details here. Now, all the little arrows here uh, represent the position of eyes. Now, what, what's very strange about preservation of this thing? You see the muscle bands very well. The dark elements are the internal organs, like probably uh, the liver or the organism. And then the little dark dots are the eyes. But with this lab alone, you will be completely lost. You probably have never realized that those are actually the eyes. Um, because it's a very nice community lab. It shows that this particular fish live in, in, uh, in school during the Cambrian period. So we talk about the bird shell, which, by the way, was around here during the, uh, during around 500 million years ago. Now, there have been other discoveries of uh, strange creatures in the Kinzers and Parkers in the US. Uh, those are lower Cambrian, much older, like actually probably around the edge of the Changjung in China. This is a description of Amos Asphys. Um, and this is an animal that, uh, this is from the Parker, that was described by Kramer in 1993. Uh, he has a very interesting story, this, this guy. It uh, was actually originally thought to be uh, some sort of graptolite. Then in the 1930s, someone suggested it might be some sort of primitive fish before being back to, uh, before being described as an arthropod, and then uh, more recently as a sort of problematic fossil potentially with adiacurrent types of uh, roots. Uh, Reflograph the specimen from the Smithsonian, and again, you can see this darker element at the front here. Uh, and again, you can see a darker zone in the body, which we think are part of the internal organs. But again, if you just add this, well, you will not be able to do, to do much. The last, and the, uh, perhaps not the, the best, and certainly not the best, but um, uh, this is from the Kinzers uh, and, uh, in, in the US. And this is just the only specimen known, which is reminiscent to some sort of uh, uh, muscle bands here preserved. Right, that was all what we knew really about, about Metaspirina. And uh, all these fossils from the other localities will not have emerged without the, the, the finding of Marble, Can Marble Canyon in uh, Northern Kutin National Park. That was discovered in, nine, uh, in 2012. Uh, sorry, this site was discovered in 2012. And we uh, published the first uh, account of it uh, in early 2014 with uh, various colleagues here that you see. Now, Marble Canyon is a very beautiful uh, place. Uh, and I highly recommend you to go there and visit uh, the Marble Canyon itself. This is around the Marble Canyon, and you can walk around here. There's a beautiful Parks Canada Trail uh, with bridges, so you can actually see this, this site very well. Um, the site itself is not a Marble Canyon itself. It's you know, a few kilometers away. Uh, but it shows here the location of the, the first fossil um, layers that we started to excavate in 2012. And we collected a number of specimens of uh, amazing uh, diversity of arthropods. Many of them are actually new. And uh, among those, uh, there was this piece here, which I'm going to show you now. Uh, this is the plate uh, of different specimens from Marble Canyon, except this one, which is the Walker Quarry, which uh, you already saw. Everything else is from Marble Canyon. So maybe it's a bit confusing. Yeah? This is the actual plate we. Uh, we published in our, in our nature paper in 2014. Uh, this is a, a detail of perhaps the, one of the best specimens. It shows the entire part. Now, the first thing that uh, strikes us here are, is a pair of large eyes at the front. Those are humongous. I mean, those are amazing eyes. Uh, and this, you can recognize a feature here, which we interpret to be the notochord. Uh, there's also all this spaghetti-like structures that are um, remnants of muscle bands. And all these features here are pharyngeal bars. Uh, so the part of the pharyngeal cavity of the organi organism um, has been preserved. And not only that, but you also have remnants of tissues here around it, which are external to these bars, which are interpreted to be the gills, and maybe other types of, uh, of uh, tissues around. So why is this important? Well. Uh, this is a reconstruction of how we think the animal looked like. Uh, this is a technical drawing. Uh, well, these bars are going to be along uh, at the, uh, the sides of the pharyngeal cavity and will have been um, helpful in, uh, for the organism to basically uh, um, 
well, uh, filter uh, feed, but as well as uh, for respiration. I mean, the, the gills would have been used for respiration. We haven't uh, represented the gills here, but the gills would have been external uh, and probably maybe sticking up outside the body itself. So I have another reconstruction of this animal called Metasprigina, um, showing how we think this animal might have been swimming around uh, after this life. So this is the reconstruction of the animal, and this is going to be the, the video. So I want to show you this video, show you how we think um, this animal might have been uh, swimming. So we think this animal was a faster swimmer than uh, Pitaya. Uh, with large eyes, he could detect uh, potential uh, predators in its environment. Uh, there are gill pores here, which uh, we think might be this sort of uh, shape. Um, and this animal also lived in schools. Uh, and as you, as you know from uh, the specimen in, uh, found in Edric Peak, and we found additional specimens um, last summer demonstrating that. Now, I don't want to bore you with too many details, but this is um, uh, basically a study of uh, ox genes in uh, different vertebrates. Uh, and those are the fish here, and, 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 and bunny fishes are here, and this is the mammals. Um, well, you can see that they actually all shared similar uh, types of ox genes that basically will form the gill bars. And this will have evolved in a common ancestor of, of the fish. Now, what's interesting, the lamprey seems to do things a bit differently. The lampreys have a basket instead of pharyngeal bars, so you can see are uh, more complex, and perhaps different sets of ox, ox genes. So traditionally, the, 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 the lampreys, and which are part of the group called cyclostomes, uh, which include the agfish, uh, were thought to be very primitive. Uh, they are jawless type of fish. They are the only um, living examples of jawless uh, fish that we know today. And they've been traditionally thought to be very primitive, and perhaps the most primitive group of, of fish. Well, actually, it turns out that um, the situation is probably more complex here. Uh, this is not a graph that you can read. Uh, I apologize for this. This is the time here. Uh, Jurassic is here. Cambrian is here. This is uh, basically uh, the, the what we call the vertebrates. Um, and uh, the, this group here are the cyclostomes, which include the eggfish and lamprey. Uh, you can see it um, starts here. Uh, now, what's interesting about this group is the fossil record, which are the, the black boxes here, uh, only starts around the upper Devonian period, right? Uh, here we're talking this little pink area about uh, Metasprigina here, and those are the Chinese forms that I mentioned, Milocomingia and Echoectis. So we are talking about here a very, very primitive stock of early fish, which already look like more like the modern vertebrates. They have large eyes, they have foundral bars and gills that are like, basically like, like modern fish. So it was extremely surprising to us uh, that we will find something like this early on in the Cambrian. Uh, and my bet is that the eggfish and the cyclostomes are actually part of uh, an ancient stock of, um, of um, jolly's fish, but perhaps much more derived than people may have assumed. Uh, Unless we find fossils of, of cyclostomes in the Cambrian, I will not be convinced. Uh, I think those are probably much more derived forms than we, 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 we think. In any case, um, this, is, uh, this is the story, really, of the origin of, of, of vertebrates, uh, where we can see that um, the primitive fish had serially arranged pharyngeal bars and differentiated into dorsal and ventral elements, the first pairs Will, uh, wa uh, will eventually evolve into, into the jaws in, in modern fish and all the other vertebrates, including us today. Uh, and the other important conclusion is that this group of fish was actually quite widespread uh, all around uh, the world during the Cambrian period. So <laughs> this is the end of my official talk on, on this vertebrates, uh, and I would like to thank the uh, the teams in 2014 for helping us in the field, um, Parks Canada for giving us permits to do the field work, and different funding agencies.